And this is where Calvinists especially, but Reformation-minded Protestants of Calvin, Luther, other varieties, this is where they begin to call foul. This is where the flags begin to be thrown all, all over the field of play. This is where the right? challenge comes out. You only get a couple of these, by the way, in the Council of Trent. And after that, uh, you're charged with the timeout. <laughs> Well, hello, and welcome to another decent and hardworking episode of On the Journey. I'm Matt Swaim, along with my colleague, Ken Hensley, and we are with the Coming Home Network. chnetwork.org is where you can find us. If you like what you're hearing, please do subscribe. Please do let a friend know about these episodes, and please do hit us with notes, uh, either in the comments here or email us through the Coming Home Network website. Again, that's chnetwork.org. I used to play in a whole bunch of underground Christian punk and metal bands. Uh, Ken used to preach from a lot of above ground Baptist pulpits. We have combined our efforts in on the journey. We've been talking a lot, Ken, about justification, and we've been talking a lot about what Protestants believe and how you came to the understanding that at least your version of Protestantism was not the full picture. And now we're finally getting more and more today into the Catholic take yeah. on justification. So where are we starting off? Well, may I preface my remarks on justification by saying that you are a decent man. Thank you. But I think you are a little too hardworking at times. You know, you could call the show, uh, you know, a swell episode of swell. The Journey Home. You could start, with, or for our, our more elderly uh, viewers, you could say a, another groovy episode. You could groovy say something episode. like that. Yeah. You don't have to go so complex if you don't, if you don't want to. But like I said, you are- Well, you're from California. You're I could have called it like a rice. bodacious, a bodacious episode. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Or boss, just, just flat out boss. Just, just or boss, righteous. Just boss. That, now righteous. that would apply. The righteous, a righteous episode. That would apply actually directly to today's content. Yes. All right. Anyway, um, you're a decent guy. That's all I got to say. Okay. In the course of our critique, you're right. In our critique of the Reformation doctrine of justification- by the imputed righteousness of Christ received by faith alone, that, that wonderful doctrine of sola fide from the time of the Reformation, you and I spent some time looking into Oxford theologian Alistair McGrath's brilliant work, A History of the Christian Doctrine of Justification, Eustitia Dei. In this work, beginning with St. Augustine, who McGrath says is the first really to set forth a developed doctrine of justification, and then tracing that doctrine throughout the first 1,500 years of Christian history, McGrath explains that the understanding that the church had of justification, that is what happens in justification, was always that in justification a man is made righteous, not merely credited with righteousness. In other words, that the view the church always had was, at its heart, essentially the Catholic view. Here's um, quoting from McGrath. Man's righteousness affected in justification is regarded by Augustine as inherent rather than imputed. Justification includes both the beginnings of man's righteousness before God and its subsequent perfection, both the event and the process. A real change in man's being, not merely his status, is envisaged in his justification so that man becomes righteous and a son of God and is not merely treated as if he were righteous and a son of God. You see, McGrath is a Protestant theologian, so he knows very, very clearly how to describe the Protestant view, and he's contrasting them here, because that's the Protestant view, that God treats us as if we were righteous. God um, God uh, credits righteousness to us. It's, ch it's a change in our status, justification, not a change in our being, all that. So uh, again, uh, quoting from McGrath, Justification is universally understood, he's saying, in the church, from Augustine all the way through to the Reformation, universally understood to involve a real change in its subject, the renovation as well as the forgiveness of the sinner. With this in mind, McGrath, all, although himself Protestant, he doesn't hold back at all. He says flat out that the idea that justification 
should be conceived as the legal imputation of righteousness to the account of the one who believes, and that justification, therefore, needs to be sharply distinguished from sanctification, where we are actually changed. McGrath says this is an idea that was brand new at the time of the Reformation. He says that it, it had never been suggested before. It had never even been contemplated. He refers to it as a theological novum, a brand new idea. Okay? And as, as you and I uh, described about two weeks ago, I believe, I think the easiest way for a Protestant to understand the Catholic view of justification, just to get it clearly in mind, really, would be to simply remove legal imputation from the picture. Just take it and toss it, discard it, and try to think of the words justification and sanctification as expressing the same essential process in two ways. A process by which God forgives our sins and infuses his own divine life into us and begins to remold us from the inside into the image in which we were created. Okay? Two ways of saying the same thing or describing the same process. Okay, with this in line then, or with this in our minds, when we come to the decree concerning justification from the sixth session of the Council of Trent, which is what I want to look at today and next week too, that is the official teaching of the Church on justification, from the decree concerning justification, we find that the Church defines justification in fairly broad terms, which makes sense if, yeah. you, if you're going to say that it involves both forgiveness and the complete change. And when you start to get into the Council of Trent, and you're going to continue to go through the Council of Trent as we go through the episode, I think some of our Protestant listeners are going to be surprised to hear exactly how biblical it actually is. Uh, we had hinted at this uh, in previous episodes, but it is pretty mm -hmm. biblical, pretty Augustinian even, uh, the things that come <laughs> yeah. out of the Council of Trent. Very much Augustinian, yes. Okay, so, so I'm I'm beginning by uh, by saying that given that given that Catholics view justification and sanctification as kind of two sides of one coin, two ways of expressing the same reality. When we come to the Council of Trent, we find the Church defining justification in fairly broad terms. Quoting now, it is a translation from the state in which man is born a child of the first Adam to the state of grace and of the adoption of the sons of God through the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Savior. It is, that is, justification is not only a remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inward man. In other words, it sounds just like, Trent sounds just like Augustine. In, in fact, Trent sounds just like every Christian theologian from the earliest church fathers up until the early 16th century, at the time of the Reformation. It also sounds like what you and I saw in our study of both the Old and the New Testaments. And I want to summarize again or rehearse something because it's 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 key in this whole issue. Protestants like to point out that the Greek verb dikai ao, that is the Greek verb that's translated to justify or to make right, to right wise, to make righteous, you could translate it in a number of different ways. They like to point out that it most often has a declarative force. Most often it means to declare someone to be righteous. And they like to remind us that when a judge justifies the righteous in a court of law, he isn't making a righteous man internally righteous. He's simply declaring him to be righteous or to be in the right as it, in terms of his standing before the law. And likewise, when a judge condemns the guilty, we never think that what it means is that the judge is making the guilty man guilty or making the wicked man wicked. He's merely, uh, he, he's merely, merely declaring the man to be unjust or to be wicked or to be guilty. Okay? So it has this declarative force, they argue. And in the same way, the way the argument goes is, is, is the Protestant would say, when God justifies us, Matt and Ken and all you Catholics, he isn't making us righteous. He's declaring us to be righteous. Okay, but here's the snag. Actually, there are two snags. The first one is this. Even if it were true that the Greek verb dikaiao always has this declarative force, okay? Even, even if it were true that it always means um, that God is declaring someone to be righteous, we would still have to ask the question, is God declaring us to be righteous because he has credited legally righteousness to us, the Protestant view? Or is he declaring us to be righteous because he has forgiven us our sins 
infused his own divine life into us and begun the process of making us righteous. Yeah, this is an important distinction. Is he saying that you are righteous because he has chosen to ignore the situation and just uh, put a righteous stamp upon it? Or is he declaring you righteous because that's what you are now in the process of becoming? Yes, yes, yeah. And so the point is, even if the word always had this declarative force, it still wouldn't prove the Protestant view over the Catholic view of justification. But there's another snag, and it's this. As it turns out, there are instances of the verb dikaiao in the New Testament that support a more Catholic understanding of, of, the, of the word, including the idea of God making us righteous. For instance, in Romans 6, 7, Paul is talking about how in baptism, in this context, he's talking about how in baptism, the power of sin is broken in our lives. That we are no longer slaves to sin, that as we've died with Christ, we've been risen with him, so we no longer, it has this practical force, we no longer have to walk in sin, but we can walk with Christ in newness of life. And in this context, Matt, he describes this as having been, quote, justified from sin, unquote. In other words, he uses the verb form of justification in a context where he's clearly talking about transformation. Okay, another one is 1 Corinthians 6.11, where Paul speaks of how Christians have been, and I'm quoting now, washed, sanctified, justified by the Spirit of our God. Again, just hear the force of that, washed, sanctified, justified by the Spirit of our God. That has a very different kind of feel than just declared to be righteous, even though yeah, it doesn't not really. sound like Paul is separating justification as a legal transaction from sanctification here. It doesn't sound like he's talking here about you know a legal thing. I mean, he he throws the words together. You've been washed. You've been sanctified. You've been justified by the Spirit of God. It sounds like he's talking here about the kind of real internal change that Ezekiel speaks of when he says that in the new covenant. God, by his spirit, will wash away our sins, will cleanse us, take out hearts of stone, give us hearts of flesh, move us to walk in his ways. He's talking about transformation. He's talking about God making us righteous. Okay? So, so again, you got that. But now, let's go on to the teaching of, of Trent on this. As Alistair McGrath says, the Catholic view holds that justification is both an event and a process. What we're going to do today is focus on justification as event. And then um, we'll look at process next week. So we're looking at the event of justification. That is what leads up to it and what happens in it. And we're going to walk right on through Trent. And we're going to read from it because I want our hearers to hear Trent speaking and not me giving a, a Protestantized, you know, Protestant convert, you know, version, something like that. Okay. The first three chapters, Matt, of the decree concerning justification from the sixth session of the Council of Trent, 1547, the first three chapters focus on stressing, and they stress unequivocally that man is completely unable to save himself, that salvation comes through Christ. Wait, you're saying that Trent says that and not Martin Luther? No, Trent says that. Here, here it is. Let me read it. The Holy Council declares first that for a correct and clear understanding of the doctrine of justification, it is necessary that each one recognize and confess that since all men had lost innocence in the prevarication of Adam, having become unclean, and as the apostle says, by nature, children of wrath, servants of sin, and under the power of the devil and of death, it goes on and on and on. And it goes on to explain then that because of this, neither Jew nor Gentile has the ability through the exercise of their own will in any way, shape, or form to rise above their fallen natures and liberate themselves from sin and from death. You know what? That's the first talking point in the four spiritual laws. That's the first talking point in the Romans road. Yeah. That's the first talking point in every sermon that this guy, Jimmy Swagger behind me ever gave. I don't see where the problem is yet. Have you listened to a lot of Jimmy Swagger sermons? I'd like to know. Only the ones that I've bought okay. and have on vinyl. Okay. So, so man can't, the Jew can't by keeping the law of Moses. This is what it says. The Gentile can't by keeping the law of his conscience. No one has the ability. And with this in mind, chapter 3 concludes, in fact, by quoting Colossians 1, 12 through 14, where the Apostle Paul encourages us to give thanks to the Father who has delivered us, to give thanks to the Father who has delivered us. You didn't do it yourself. You can't do it. Who has delivered us from the domain of darkness and has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, 
in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Chapters 1 through 3 conclude by quoting Paul, saying that it is the Father who has delivered us. So far, I don't know about you, but so far it doesn't sound exactly like a damning system of works righteousness on this end. No, not even the slightest. As a matter of fact, uh, so far, someone would say, okay, um, I'm not sure yet what Luther has a problem with in the Catholic teaching on justification. Maybe it's going to come in these next few paragraphs. Yeah, and it does begin to come in the next few, yeah. Okay, but let's move on to chapters 4 and 5 then of Trent. In chapters 4 and 5, the decree concerning justification builds on the foundation laid in chapters 1 through 3, and it teaches this. Not only can man not save himself, now we learn in chapters 4 and 5 that even our ability to turn to God and place our faith in Christ, the Savior, is the result of God's grace working in us. That's the second point. And listen to Trent. Justification must proceed from the predisposing grace of God through Jesus Christ, whereby, without any merits on their part, they are called, that they who by sin had been cut off from God may be disposed through his quickening and helping grace. Okay, you got predisposing grace, his quickening and helping grace, may be disposed through his quickening and helping grace to convert themselves by freely assenting to and cooperating with that grace. Okay, let me separate the two ideas. So on the one hand, God must reach out to us, predisposing us through his quickening, his helping grace to convert. And yet, the council declares, this grace is not irresistible. And you know what? we run into Calvin and whatnot. Yeah, the irresistible grace, the I and the tulip. Right. Uh, but what's interesting is that you see that echoed even in the current edition of the Catechism of the Catholic Church in the section on prayer. There's a wonderful paragraph that says almost the same kind of thing. Uh, and I just want to quote it real quickly. It sure. says, God calls man first. Man may forget his creator or hide far from his face. He may run after idols or accuse the deity of having abandoned him. Yet the living and true God tirelessly calls each person to that mysterious encounter known as prayer. In prayer, the faithful God's initiative of love always comes first. Our own first step is always a response. Okay, kind beauti of it, yep. I beauti mean, beautifully it. said. So the teaching of the church then is that God reaches out first. He predisposes us. He quickens us, his helping grace. And then on the other side, though, this is a grace to which we must freely assent and with which we must freely cooperate. And this is where... Calvinists especially, but Reformation-minded Protestants of Calvin, Luther, other varieties, this is where they begin to call foul. This is where the flags begin to be thrown all, all over the field of play. This is where the all challenge right? comes out. You only get a couple of these, by the way, in the Council of Trent, and after that, uh, you're charged with the timeout. Yeah, or yeah, yeah, five yards back, 15, then time. Okay. Yeah, by the way, I should point out that uh, at this point, the Wesleyans and Arminians are still tracking. We're still good. You know, yeah, we, I understand. We, I understand. Not, we've not disagreed with anything yet. I understand. In fact, reading John Wesley was was a uh, was part of the step for me. I want this to be made clear. Both Luther and Calvin, and other varieties as well, but both Luther and Calvin viewed man as being entirely, and I mean completely, passive in conversion. Um, in his work, the bondage of the will, um, Luther used the image of a rider on a horse, and he basically said. Before we are actually regenerated by God in a sovereign act of God, um, the devil is like riding us. The devil's on the saddle, and we're the horse, and the devil's riding us any way he wants, to the right, to the left, forward, backward. The devil's there. Regeneration is, uh, is God's sovereign act by which he, in, a, in essence, pushes the devil off the saddle, jumps onto the saddle himself, and begins to ride us. And now God rides us. But in either case, we have no freedom. And regeneration is a sovereign act. Man is entirely passive in conversion and regeneration. In fact, one of the analogies that that uh, that I liked to use when I was a Calvinist, and that is used often by many, to describe regeneration is the raising of Lazarus from from the dead. If you remember, um, John chapter eleven, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is in the tomb. Lazarus stinketh. Okay, it's been four days, and he already stinketh. Jesus simply walks up to the tomb and he, in a loud voice, he calls Lazarus, come forth. And the, and the dead man, you know, still wrapped in, in, you know, wrapped up like a mummy, comes walking out 
of the cave. And this, I would say, and many say, this is exactly what happens in regeneration. We are dead, completely spiritually dead. And by a sovereign act, God simply calls us forth and we're regenerated without any um, cooperation on our part, without any uh, you know, agreement with God's grace or anything like that. Well, we've been talking about dead horses as we're doing segment after segment on the same thing. In this case, in this analogy, I guess you're either dead or you are a horse. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. In the two analogies, well, you know, okay, we're kind of chuckling now, but this is a view that I had for many, many years, um, and over time, I found myself more and more bothered. And I got to say, reading John Wesley was a part of this. Still, totally Protestant, but I found myself bothered more and more by the fact that in Scripture, which was my basis, the inspired Word of God, God's sovereignty and human freedom were both presented as, as, as true, both true. In one passage, you know, we'll find Jesus saying, no man can come to me unless the Spirit draws him, true. Or we'll find the Apostle Paul speaking of those who were ordained to eternal life, quote unquote, that's in Acts chapter 13. But in another passage, we find Jesus weeping, I mean, he's weeping over Jerusalem, and he's saying, how often I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks beneath her wing but you would not. And I could quote thousands of passages from Genesis to Revelation that assume the freedom that we have to turn to God, to respond to God, and the freedom that we have to not turn to God and not respond to God. And I remember reading Wesley, he just listed out so many of these passages that I was, uh, that, that I was you know, I, I was just really struck by the difficulty of trying to rationally resolve this issue in one way or the other. Divine sovereignty and human freedom a great mystery. But at least I could see that, okay, Wesley, I'll say too, but at least I could see that Catholicism, as I began to study Catholicism, was trying to present both sides of the mystery, trying to hold them in balance, rather than simply eliminating one side of the equation in order to favor the other and rationally resolve the tension. And the chicken analogy works better than the horse analogy in this, because if, as you were saying earlier, that you're just a horse, and all that either happens is that you, you know, have the devil ride you mm -hmm. or God rides you, and you know, the, there's not really a whole lot of will involved in the case of the horse. But with the chickens, you know, I don't know if you've ever had chickens. I mean, I've had chickens, fairly unsuccessful. I've had them on my plate at yes. dinner. I've had those too. I've also been a very unsuccessful urban chicken farmer in a previous life. Uh, but you know, a chicken can try and do what they can, and sometimes the chickens obey, the, the baby chicks obey, yeah. and sometimes they do not. Right. Uh, there has to be a cooperation in order for things to work. Um, well, I thought you, I thought when you mentioned chicken, you were going to do a chicken and egg analogy, which comes first. Well, you know, I did that yeah. uh, the other day. I actually ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I, I'll tell you later which one came first. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. This idea of the mystery of divine sovereignty and human freedom, and the fact that in Scripture I could just find plenty of passages that emphasized either pole in this mystery. I thought about the early centuries of Christianity as well, when the church's Christology was being hammered out, for instance. Okay, the hypostatic union of two natures in one person, okay, the, the mystery of the hypostatic union. At the time, Matt, the heretics, the heretical positions were precisely the positions of those who refused to hold this mystery in balance and insisted upon trying to rationally resolve it one direction or the other. So you'd have people that would say, well, Jesus was actually God just appearing to be a man, the docetus, just appearing to be a human being. And on the other side, you'd have those heretics who said, well, he was actually just a, a man, a very high created being upon whom the Spirit of God came or was infused into them. These were the heretical positions, the people who, who demanded that somehow this mystery be rationally resolved. And the church's position was to say, no, he is fully God, he is fully man, one person with two divine natures, and, and, and hold the mystery in balance. And we see exactly the same thing when they came to the Trinity. Who were the heretics at the time when the Trinity was being you know, hammered out and, and defined? It was those on one side who said, you know, come on, let's just be honest, there are three gods. We're talking about three gods here, the tritheists. There's a the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And then there were those on the other side that said, look, we're, there's only one God, 
and, and, and therefore God is just manifesting himself in different forms, sometimes as father, sometimes as son, the modalists. And, and again, the tritheists on the one side, trying to rationally resolve the mystery in their direction, the modalists on the other side were both rejected. And the position of orthodoxy, the position of the church was, this is a great mystery, one God eternally existing as three divine persons. And you and find so, this throughout everything. It, it, again, we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the answer is yes. When you say, "Is it faith?" Yeah, Does it works. Yes. Is it yes? Both and know, both and free it's will. Always, both and is it mercy or justice? Yes, because yeah. And so yeah, I was coming to appreciate then the fact that the Catholic view held this as a mystery and simply wanted to try to hold it in balance. And I was coming to appreciate how the Council of Trent asserts both God's gracious action and our freedom to respond. And uh, listen to this one again. I'm quoting now from Trent. While God touches the heart of man through the illumination of the Holy Ghost, man himself neither does absolutely nothing while receiving that inspiration, since he can also reject it, nor yet is he able by his own free will and without the grace of God to move himself to righteousness in his sight. Hence, when it is said, I, and I, I love this part because it's quoting scripture, hence when it is said in the sacred writings, this is from Zechariah 1.3, turn ye to me and I will turn to you, we are reminded of our liberty. And when we reply, now quoting Lamentations 5.21, convert us, O Lord, and we shall be converted, we confess that we need the grace of God. Two passages that beautifully hold out both sides of this mystery. And are completely in harmony with what Scripture indicates is the case. Uh, you know that God draws and we respond. That God calls yes. the Israel Israelites to obey, and when they obey, they are saved. When they don't, they are not. I Amen. mean, there's yep. nothing. There's nothing here that's that's surprising if you've paid attention to the narrative of salvation history. Well, again, Zechariah one three, turn ye to me, God says, and I will turn to you. And then Lamentations 5.21, convert us, O Lord, and we shall be converted. Okay, in chapter 6 now, the council describes what comes next. And I, um, I, I'm summarizing it here. As we respond in freedom to God's predisposing grace, God begins then to move us from the inside to trust him, to love him, to want to repent of our sins, to want to keep his commandments. And now I'm reading from uh, the Council of Trent again. Now they are disposed to that righteousness when, aroused and aided by divine grace, receiving faith by hearing, receiving faith by hearing, they are moved freely toward God, believing to be true what has been divinely revealed and promised, especially that the sinner is justified by God, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And they begin to love him as the fountain of all righteousness and on that account are moved against sin by a certain hatred and detestation. Finally, they resolve to receive baptism, to begin a new life, and to keep the commandments of God. So we see here God's predisposing, quickening grace comes. When we cooperate with that grace, then God actually begins to create faith within us, to create love within us, to create a hatred of sin, a desire to repent. But the council says it is in baptism that one receives, in the fullest sense, the grace of justification. And let me read that before we discuss it. This translation, that is from a state of being in Adam to that of being in Christ, cannot be affected except through the labor of regeneration, that is referring to baptism, or its desire, as it is written, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So you've got this, I mean, next week we're going to talk about the process, but, but there's a process that even leads up to justification. And one thing we can't do here, we can't take off and do again a full biblical historical study of the doctrine of baptism and baptismal regeneration. And so I have to refer those who are listening and are interested to episodes 14, 15, and 16 of On the Journey where we, we did a much more full treatment of baptism in, in some detail, okay? But, but having said this, in our study of justification in the Old Testament, Matt, I mean, you and I read, I would say several times, 
that beautiful description in Ezekiel chapter 36, where God promised of what God promised to do when the new covenant would one day come and be instituted. You know that passage, I will sprinkle clean water on you, um, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from your impurities, wash away your sins, all that beautiful language there. Well, the fulfillment of the promise made by Ezekiel is the new covenant sacrament of baptism. And I believe that we can see this in the very first altar call, not a Jimmy Swaggart altar call, but the very first altar call of the very first sermon that was ever preached in the Christian era. And that is the sermon of St. Peter. It's the day of Pentecost. They're praying in the upper room. The Holy Spirit falls upon them. Peter goes out among the crowd and he opens his mouth and he begins to preach. The crowds, Acts chapter 2, we read are cut to the heart and they cry out to Peter, what must we do? To which Peter responds, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In other words, I believe that what Trent is affirming here is really nothing more than what the church affirmed from the earliest apostolic fathers and all the way up to the time at, at the Reformation when, when some of the Reformers took a different view of baptism. That is, that in baptism we are washed of our sins, we are born from above, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and we become the children of God. Doesn't get much more biblical than that. I mean, really, Peter is just saying the kind of thing that I never heard at an altar call but just makes complete mm -hmm. sense in the context of everything you just laid out and in everything salvation history is built up to tell us about what we should do when we are cut to the heart, right? Yeah. Repent and yeah. be baptized. Yeah. Pretty clear. Yeah, and when we, were, when we were discussing that issue, I'm sure that I mentioned the fact that one thing that struck me as I was studying Catholicism is that if I had preached a million sermons from my Baptist pulpit, if, if the crowd had cried out, what must we do? I would have never thought to say what Peter says. I wouldn't have said, repent and be baptized. I would have said, um, believe in Jesus, accept Christ as your personal Savior. I would have said any number of things, but it would never have crossed my mind. And yeah, when you talk biblical, when, I, when we add up so far what Trent has said, it's, it, it, Trent has basically said, look, no one is able to convert themselves, number one. God must reach out with his predisposing, quickening grace to us, first of all, to which we must respond with our wills. And when we do respond and cooperate with that grace, God begins to create within us love, faith, hatred of sin, the desire to repent of our sins and to walk in obedience to commandments, and the desire to be baptized. And then it says, in baptism, or it's desire, we receive this full gifts as described by Ezekiel 36, and sin is washed away. We become children of God. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given to us. Heart of stone is at least begun the process of removing it. All that. It's a very beautiful step-by-step um, -step kind of look at what happens, tearing it apart in detail. Well, and what I find interesting and, and what I find beautiful about all this, and uh, you're going to talk about this in a minute when you hit into chapter seven and eight of the council, is that idea of taking faith and isolating as a concept or grace and isolating as a concept and justification as isolating it as a concept. It's like playing you know, a, a different string on the guitar you know, and another string on the guitar and another mm -hmm. string on the guitar. And the church just sort of strums them like a chord and they kind of come together in this sort of beautiful harmony. Uh, and it just makes it kind of this fuller and richer sound. And you start to think it was never meant to be these yeah. alones that are all part of the Reformation doctrines. Yeah, but 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 this picture, yeah, th th this total um, inclusive picture. Now, in, in, in chapters seven and eight, the council goes on to explain what it means to say that justification is by faith through grace. Because that's one thing, I mean, to this day, you know, we titled our series A Damning System of Works Righteousness. I took that phrase from a book written by Protestant theologians um, called Justification by Faith, in which they're describing the Catholic view of justification as a damning system of works righteousness. And yet, in chapter seven and eight, the council explains that justification is by faith and through grace. But this, this is how it explains it. 
Justification is not only the remission of sins, but also the sanctification and renewal of the inward man. We are said to be justified by faith because faith is the beginning of human salvation, the foundation and root of all justification, without which it is impossible to please God and to come to the fellowship of his sons. Which is something we talked about last week, how faith remains at the heart of everything. Our obedience flows from what we trust, what we, you know, are, are, are serving, are loving, all of it. And this is what the council says. It's the beginning of salvation. It's the foundation and root of all justification. The whole process, faith, obedience, persevered into the end. Faith is at the core of all of it. And therefore, it's correct to say that justification is by faith. Now, through grace, we are said to be justified gratuitously, that is, by grace, because none of those things that precede justification, whether faith or works, can merit the grace of justification. This grace comes to each of us completely unmerited. You're saying we don't earn our salvation. No, we don't. And we're going to get into that part in more detail next week. What we've looked at today is the event of justification. That is what leads up to it, the, the predisposing grace, and what it is when it happens. Referring back to the Old Testament type that we discussed a couple of weeks ago, Matt, I would say this, uh, you know, uh, justification as event is like our exodus and our crossing of the Red Sea, you know, where the blood is spread and they walked out of Egypt and they were baptized in the Red Sea. They move from the old life into the new life, their life as slaves to their life as free men and women under God. Next week, we're going to look at what Trent teaches us about justification as process which I could liken to our journey to the promised land. And when we do, though, we're, we're going to continue to see that faith and grace remain at the heart of everything, that at each step of the way, as God did with the Israelites, God does with us. He gives us everything we need to make that next step of faith, of obedience, and to persevere in that to the end until we cross over into the promised land. At no point we're going to see can you say that the Catholic doctrine of justification runs off the rails and, and morphs itself into a damning system of works righteousness? Not at all. And we'll see more about what Trent has to say on these and other topics moving ahead. You know, it's funny. Every time you say, well, Trent says this and Trent says that, it's like you're talking about a guy named Trent. Um, and it, uh -huh. I do think it's funny that people name their kids after church councils when it's Trent and Florence and even Constance, but not so much when it's Nicaea and Chalcedon, Chalcedon. and Lateran. You know, Constantinople. It's like naming your kids after the virtues. Name them faith and hope and charity. Don't name them fortitude. Just don't. If you're going to name your son after the Lateran Council, at least just say Lateran. Don't make it like third Lateran Council. Yeah, this is my son, fourth Lateran. No. <laughs> yeah. No. Not a I have idea. a grandson, as you know, named um, Albert the Great. Oh, well, good. So He just had a feast day. He's two and a half years old right now. Very cool. Well, he'll, he's only going to get greater then. Actually, I'm the only one that calls him out, Albert the Great. I've done it from the second he was born. and. And it's kind of a joke in the family. I mean, don't but deny I'm, it. I'm looking ahead. Don't I'm deny looking ahead. Greatness. Well, Ken, I have appreciated yeah. this particular episode, and I appreciate the fact that we're going to talk about event and process yep. uh, as though it were a process, right? So it's going to take a couple of episodes to get through this question of what it means to be justified, uh, what the church teaches about these things. In the meantime, if you like what you're hearing, if you're enjoying the conversation, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, or any of the podcast channels on which on the journey is featured. Please come check us out at the Coming Home Network, chnetwork.org. We have not only lots more resources for people who are interested in the Catholic faith or coming back to the Catholic faith that they've left, but we also have an online community full of people who are at various stages of interest in the Catholic faith, all talking to one another there. So chnetwork.org, check us out. In the meantime, Ken, thank and, you so much. Yeah, and I, I just want to say, even if you listen on as a podcast, Go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. That'll help. There you go. Just we just want Thank to bump you, up the numbers. It's 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 good. Thank you, our, sir. Good for our our humility. Yep. Thanks so much. <laughs> Talk to you again next week. Okay. Bye bye.